From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Matt, this uh, this was very close to being one of those episodes where we might have we might have run into some trouble, you know, because we're we're touching on something that's controversial for a lot of people and close to the hearts of many of our listeners. We are. We're also. I mean, it's a topic that I think has invaded all of our minds from young ages. I think there's a, a, a time in many of our lives when the concept of some other intelligence from some other place far, far away, either visits for you know, just interest reasons or for some very specific purpose. Mm-hmm. And and I think that concept, um, when it digs into your subconscious and your conscious deeply enough, as at least it has mine, um, you become, I wouldn't say obsessed, but you you, you become fixated a bit on the idea of either we are completely alone or there there are things out there far beyond our understanding. And good God, that's either terrifying or amazing. Right, right. Uh, what's that old that old quote? Uh, that either I, either thing being true is terrifying. Yes, right? exactly. So it, it's funny you mention that because uh, according to a 2019 poll uh, from – insiders insider.com which of course is you know not pew research or anything it seems like one in five u.s residents don't just believe that extraterrestrials exist somewhere out there which is almost a mathematical certainty right they believe that aliens physical extraterrestrials have actually visited this planet of ours at some point that's right folks today we are returning to the fascinating controversial topic of UFOs. Longtime listeners, you will remember this is a point of contention on this show. What is a UFO? It is literally anything in the sky that is both an object and cannot be conclusively identified. It's tricky here because the concept of UFOs, at least in the West, is fundamentally inseparable from the concept of extraterrestrials, right? And so many times uh, through a, a variety of outlets, we see these two, we see these two things conflated and we see a, uh, we see a vast range of investigative endeavor going into identifying these unidentified flying objects. Some of this is maybe breathless, little sensationalistic, uh, you know, I'm thinking kind of the ancient aliens vibe you might see on the History Channel. Mm-hmm. And then some other stuff is is highly, uh, uh, highly objective, I would say more on the skeptical side uh, and taking an academic approach. We're aiming to do that today. But wait, Matt, you might be saying – Pump your brakes, Ben. You might have followed up with. Uh, you guys are you guys are, are crackerjack researchers, but who are you to tell us about the uh, the nuts and bolts science? You know some of the engineering uh, behind and chemical substances that would be you know part and parcel of these claims of uh, UFOs or of these claims more specifically of recovered artifacts. Well. Dear friends, you would be absolutely correct, and that is why Matt, Paul, and I are not diving into this rabbit hole alone. We have a very special guest that we would like to welcome to the show, Christopher Cogswell, the host of the Mad Scientist podcast. This is a comedy show on the history and philosophy of pseudoscience that he does along with his fantastic co-host, Marie Mayhew. Chris, thanks so much for coming on the air with us today. Oh, guys, thanks for having me. Been a longtime fan, so I'm really uh, kind of nerding out over here getting to come on the show. Oh, come on. 
<laughs> you have expertise, as we just outlined in that introduction to you. We are very much uh, the ones here in, in the position of being excited to talk to you. Uh, we're, we're just some guys. So look, we're we're going to jump right into it. Um, like, tell us tell us exactly what your background is. Why? Tell us more about what you've done. Why we believe that you are an expert on this subject. Sure. So my background is in. So I first went to school uh, at the University of New Hampshire. I received a bachelor's of science degree in chemical engineering and also philosophy. And in my, you know, I've always sort of had a lifelong interest in, um, in these kinds of subjects. You know, the joke I used to always tell whenever I give a talk on this stuff or I speak in public about this is, you know, um, one of the main questions I always had was why was it that my grandma, who was an otherwise, you know, very, very intelligent woman, she spoke like five different languages um, she came here with her family from Italy, you know, with nothing and built a family that now includes, you know, people that are, you know, living successfully. And, you know, it's just a, it's, it was so wild to me and un, just not understandable why she would both be so smart and capable and have such a firm grasp of history and science, despite her lack of education coming from, you know, Croatia and then to Italy and whatever, but then also have her believe that you know climate change was a chinese hoax right wow, wow. <laughs> or 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 that you know um or that uh she had this crazy she had this crazy idea i don't know where she picked it up but it used to drive my family wild she had this idea so she was a diabetic and she had this idea that if you put lemon juice into things that were sweet it would for some reason <laughs> negate all of the sugar you know, oh. so I'll never forget. We were we were on a road trip with her up to Michigan to visit my cousin and we stopped at a Dairy Queen and she got this huge thing of vanilla ice cream and she squirted. She used to carry lemon juice with her <laughs> and she squirted the lemon juice on the ice cream. And it was like, you know, that scene from the nanny where she puts like the bagel, two bagels on top of a slice of pizza. And she's like, the body doesn't know. Yeah, that was essentially my grandma's view of nutrition, you know, <laughs> Um so anyway, so I, that was always really fascinating to me. So I spent a lot of time doing kind of, you know, research and reading and everything else about this subject of pseudoscience and why people believe incorrect. Incorrect is maybe a too strong a word for a subject like the UFO subject, let's say. But why do people believe things that are either patently untrue or seem to fly in the face of reason? And mm -hmm. so... Uh, I then went on to get a PhD in chemical engineering from Northeastern University in Boston. My research project there um, focused on the use of uh, nanomaterials for um, for advanced uh, capture, catalysis, and um, just essentially pulling things that are hard to get out of the air or water or different environments. Um, capturing those in efficient ways and then being able to upgrade those to usable chemicals. So the most famous case of that is carbon dioxide. Hmm. Um, so capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, which where it's in very low concentrations is challenging and difficult. Um, and then, so that part is hard. The capture part is difficult, but then actually converting that useless carbon in the CO2 form into a usable chemical feedstock, like a polymer base, you know, a monomer or whatever, that's even a bigger challenge. So that was sort of the applications I looked at, but the work that I did specifically was on the creation of layered nanostructured materials or materials that could be after synthesis um, edited in some way. So you could apply a chemical, uh, you know, heat or temperature or a change in pH or electromagnetism or something and make the materials shape or chemical properties change in the desired way. So the example I give is like almost like an accordion, right? When it's in its normal state, the accordion is kind of pushed together, right? And it's a small volume. But if you apply force to either side, you can get the accordion to expand, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. With chemicals, you can do, well, with some materials, you can do almost the same thing, right? The idea of, uh, I'm sure you've used the kind of, you know, trick from when you were a kid or even now as an adult, you can't open up the, you can't open up a jar with a metal lid so you put it under hot water, right, to expand the metal. That's that's the the metal itself. Those bonds expanding due to the application of temperature. 
Um, that's basically what I worked on was applying things like that in specific ways to create things that would be useful um, at the bulk chemical scale. So, yeah, yeah, I feel like we're on the same page. One time uh, for the science fair, I made this thing that looked like a volcano. But get this, there we Chris. Go. <laughs> <laughs> it was no magma involved. So it's basically uh, you, me, and Houdini. Uh, maybe, maybe Nikola Tesla. I don't know. Uh, but I, that that aside, you know, one thing that I I think is um, is key to effective communication is that use of metaphor and analogy that you you just uh, you just presented to us because. Uh, one one thing that would be an immediate question for a lot of people in the audience today would be, uh, all right, this guy, this guy has a PhD in chemical engineering from Northeastern. He has intense background. He's a subject matter expert. Uh, why, why has he decided to make a podcast? You know, is uh, and you and I had talked about this a little bit off air. Uh, did you did you find yourself uh, inspired by a specific case? Did you find yourself inspired by the format or, you know, what was, what's your origin story? What's like act two of this origin story that leads you into, uh, what will, what would become the mad scientist podcast? Right. When did I realize I must dress up like a bat to fight crime? Yes, exactly. Um, (laughs) Right. I will use their fear against them. So, uh, really what it was, so like I said, I, I, my family um, is really steeped in, I would say, the kind of old world traditions of, you know, superstitions and, you know, religion in my family was almost always more like magic in a weird way. And my mom in particular loved that stuff. You know, uh, we were always watching horror movies together and she did tarot cards and uh, astrology and all this stuff. And then on top of that, you had my grandma who would make these kinds of, you know, weird concoctions of lemon juice and you know, other random ingredients um, because Dr. Oz told her that they would make her live to 100 or, you know, whatever it was. Right. Right. So um, we always had that kind of background in our family. And it never really made sense to me because, again, we are otherwise very intelligent people. Right. Mm-hmm. Um so trying to understand trying to understand what that line was and then also seeing also seeing i suppose that there were things that we considered there were things that me as someone in the sciences would outright consider to be ridiculous that if you looked at them from the from the standpoint of say philosophy or sociology or anthropology or or these other fields you know what a scientist or someone in the hard sciences might call a soft science, right? If you look at them from those perspectives, they stop being ridiculous. You know, one of the hot topics in the UFO field right now is this idea of um, the idea of like out of body experiences almost, right? And kind of uh, using your consciousness to contact entities and whatever. And so you see this in documentaries like the DMT molecule documentary on Netflix and, you know, it's all over the place, right? That idea goes back thousands of years, right? This idea of having almost like a a spiritual experience to meet with other entities. And although from the standpoint of, say, you know, materialist um, science, it doesn't make sense, right? How could your consciousness transcend this physical barrier and everything else? From the standpoint of philosophy, um, that's a, that was kind of the status quo for mo- most of human history was the idea that something like that made total sense, right? If anything, our consciousness being the collection of a random assortment of molecules um, would have been the extreme position and the position that didn't make sense. So understanding how that transition happens, I think is really important because it pseudoscience has an effect. It has a policy effect, right? Um, We just saw the Australian brush fires go completely out of control, right? Yeah. Yes. People still believe that that is not, you know, the misinformation around that is is intense, right? It was arson. It was, you know, all, ex, all these other options, but not that it's the thing that the sciences consider to be the cause, right? So combating pseudoscience, knowing why people believe it, and also understanding those periods, and there's there's plenty of them in the history of science, 
where we transition from science to pseudoscience and vice versa, right? Cases where scientific establishment became pseudoscience. Understanding those transitions and why societies accept certain scientific ideas or technological ideas is really important. Agreed, agreed. There's a, it's strange because one thing that we often find in our own, uh, our, our own research rabbit holes is that more than a few things that would be considered fringe theories or conspiracy theories or what have you actually qualify as folklore, you know, and they're, mm -hmm. they're stories that we tell ourselves. And of course, you know, there is a definition of a great story, at least for the human species, regardless of genre. Uh, and it may not be said explicitly or, or so nakedly all the time, but the mark of a good story for every single audience member is that they walk away feeling this was ultimately in some way about me. <laughs> that's a, And that's like the folklore aspects, you know. Uh, we see the evolution uh, from – we've talked about this before. This is very old hat, I think, uh, to Matt and I and to you as well, Chris. We've talked about the beat-by-beat -beat similarities between uh, the stories of alien abductions and stories of people being abducted by the fae or fairies, right, or the, mm -hmm. un the unseen world of some sort. So we know that there is – we know that there is an an underlying ancient narrative, uh, something about the human mind and the way we categorize and the way we uh, synthesize and digest the world around us. Something about that makes us, compels us to create these stories at, or to um, – even, even if those stories are just interpretations of true events. But now – to steal a line from Fox News, now more than ever, we are in a situation where uh, we can bring to bear methodology. We can bring to bear uh, millennia of, uh, of hard-won scientific progress. And that's something that we wanted to dive into with you today. Uh, Matt and I have, have a couple of things that we wanted to ask you. Now, this is all this is all completely – again, you're, you're our expert here. This is all completely uh, going to be up to you how you want to respond. Uh, we, just, we just want your, your opinion on things. And if there's ever something – Paul, you might have to bleep me here. If there's ever something we ask along the way today where you say, well, what do you think about blah, 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 and you think it's bullshit? That's fine. You just say hmm. that's total malarkey <laughs> and, <it'll> be, <laughs> and it'll be perfect. So one of the uh, – I don't, I don't know, Matt. Do you want to do you yeah, want to do I the start? Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, just jumping straight into this, Chris. I am fascinated by the the kind of cutting edge that we know of in material science, in 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 chemicals, and every just everything from physics, everything that we know on this planet as humans, the knowledge of technology that we have in its current state and the cutting edge of that. And how we kind of take that cutting edge and vision of the future to explain the versions of possible extraterrestrial technology. Like perhaps if there was an intelligent species, let's say several millennia or maybe even millions of years ahead of us from a technology perspective, um, what kinds of physical phenomena would they be exploiting in order to have much higher technology than we have, right? Um, so I'm just going to start with what I know, what kind of perplexes me as a layman. So I want to just ask you about superconductivity, about materials that that uh, show these properties or have these properties, and how perhaps that could play some role in advanced technology either now or in the future. Sure. So... But first off, I guess I want to speak to something that you said kind of in your preamble to the to the ultimate question on superconductivity, right? Which is this idea of understanding the science or trying to fit our own view of science to what we expect a an extraterrestrial civilization to be like, right? Yeah. One of the one of the funniest things that I, I we do this on the show um occasionally, and I love doing this whenever I talk to somebody who's, you know, since doing the show and now kind of going to conventions and speaking to people and being, you know, involved as, as involved as a 
skeptical scientists can be allowed to be involved in these things. Um, mm. I really love hearing, you know, when someone tells you a story that is clearly, you know, it's, it's like watching the Jetsons, right? It's like, and I'm not just saying that because my last name is Cogswell. So, my, <laughs> you know, my progeny will create a wonderful space empire for all of us. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, thanks. By the way. So, <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. There's a, there's something really funny about the idea of how did they think the future would look when they were doing the Jetsons, you know, for some reason, they still thought we were making like we were still producing machines with people, right? Mm -hmm. Like the the guy in the Jetsons worked at a cog factory, right? Or he worked at a sprocket factory. That's crazy. <laughs> you know, robots would, you know, the, the, we had these, uh, you know, the idea of how technology should look in the future is always actually a really good tell for these UFO cases that they're not true, right? So one of them that's really funny and it comes up a lot on ancient aliens is this idea of a nuclear weapon being used. Why do we assume that they don't have better weaponry than that? Or why would they need weaponry? Oh, you know, right. if they're able to phase through walls and stuff can, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's just crazy. Right. Um, so anyways, in terms of, in terms of kind of where science is in terms of superconductivity and superconductors and all these other things, there are kind of a couple of areas where I guess I would say the challenges currently exist that are, I mean, hopefully going to be solved in some fashion in our lifetimes. The first one is the fact that we don't really have a fundamental grasp right now of how electrons transfer through materials efficiently or, or kind of how they even really transfer. We have a general idea, right, in metals and things. And we know that as electrons are being – so electrons sit in – if you remember from school, you were probably taught that electrons sit in something like almost a planetary model, right? where the nucleus is the center of the universe. It's like the sun, right? Or the center of the solar system, I should say. So it, the, the nucleus is like the sun. That's really heavy. And then around that nucleus are electrons orbiting in different energy levels, right? Yes. That's kind of true. They don't really sit in energy. They don't really orbit. They, they exist in things called orbitals. So they do orbit around, but the the shape is not circular. It's, it's you know, defined by their probability fields. Um. But anyways, that's, that's really not the important point here. The important point oh, is... Oh, no, we're going to get more into probability fields because that's a whole other thing. But can, a, but oh, it's going to be continue. great. Oh, I'm super excited then. <laughs> whole so, different bag of badgers. So as the electron gets excited, it jumps into a higher state, and then it can become de-excited, and then it will go down. So it, it, they, they call these bands, right? So an electron can be excited to jump into a conduction band, and then it will be able to transfer. But as it transfers, it leaves behind an electron hole, a place where an electron should be, but maybe isn't, right? Mm -hmm. There are materials that hold those properties, right? And that's like with things, um, that's like with computer chips, right? How we write memory in, in, or how we hope to write memory in quantum computers is you would have a space where a quanta should be, but it's not, right? Because of transport or whatever. But what we don't really know or what we, we are currently still trying to understand is how to really efficiently um, control the materials properties themselves to make transfer possible in the ways that we would need. And what is it that makes something become superconductive? What is it about the magnetic structure, the electronic structure of the material that causes it to become superconductive? Um, and so part of that study or part of those sorts of materials are we have the ability now to build materials essentially atom by atom, right? We can use ultra high vacuum chambers or atomic layer deposition or other methods where um, you can build a crystal lattice as you would like to. A crystal lattice is just the structure that a crystal, a solid material with a crystalline form exists in. Um, we can actually control that growth. Uh, and so building those materials and trying to understand the diff, you know, what effect would a silicon, um, a silicon phase next to a, you know, um, I don't know, uh, whatever, some other kind of ceramic phase, how, what, what effect would that have on conduction of electrons, right? Uh -huh. What effect would that have on the superconducting properties? That sort of testing is going on across the country and it's, it's super interesting. And frankly, it's above my pay grade. Wow. Um, I didn't go into I didn't go into physics specifically because I was like I don't understand what an electron hole is. I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> I'm just going to deal with chemicals, not atoms, and not electrons. Let's pause here 
for a word from our sponsor. And we've returned. It's somewhat inspiring, is it not, to to think that these sorts of questions may have answers uh, that – and. Well, they certainly do have answers, but that we may discover these answers within our individual lifetimes. That's to me, that's that's fascinating. Assuming we don't burn the whole shebang down, right? Uh, before Too late, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, but this, so okay, so that's the real life provable version of where we are. I especially appreciate the point you made, Chris, about. Uh, how we're we're sort of projecting what we know as humans onto any hypothetical extraterrestrial society. That that point about the nuclear weapon stayed with me because, of course, if we only had spears and we were making up a story about a superior civilization, they would have the biggest and best spear, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It wouldn't even be a, a spear, though. It would be something completely different that you have no concept of. That's and what it, it would just really vaporizes be. everything. That's what it really be. <laughs> but if well, we that's, were, well, that's why yeah. that's why stories of super weapons in like the Middle Ages were things like weapons that never broke, weapons that never went dull, mm-hmm. right? Oh yeah. It was not, you know, they had no. It wasn't even like oh, they imagined what a gun would be, or you know, um, anything like that. You know, it was just. They were like, oh, what if our spears never broke? What if they never went dull? Um, that would be a super weapon. Yeah, but what about via manas, Chris? Come on. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, the flying right, the flying carpets of death with uh, nuclear rays. Yeah. I, I, I know. Have to, I, I know. have to say it genuinely intrigues me. That doesn't necessarily mean that I – or doesn't mean that I believe that that's precisely what it was. Mm. I think it's just such an intriguing concept that was somewhat explored – Mm-hmm. Um, but not uh, fleshed out in any kind of material way. Um, well, yeah, but does yeah, it ever does it ever make you wonder if it's just being described in the understanding as we're talking about this? But it it was some kind of um, more than natural phenomena, like that was a lost occurring? technology. Is that what yeah, you're I mean, about? I'm I'm genuinely like, I'm wondering if like when you're thinking about that philosophically and you pull yourself out a little bit of the scientific mind, mm-hmm. um, like do, does that does that give you pause at all or does it make you go down a rabbit hole or do you just kind of push it away as like, that's obviously not Uncle. what this is. Yeah. yeah. Well, so honestly, one of the, f- one of the things, you know, one of the first books on this subject that I really, you know, besides like the, you know, time life, uh, Bigfoot, right? Like those kinds of kids books. Uh, are you, are you the- talking about mysteries of the unknown? Because if you I- are, sir, I thank you to treat that, that, <laughs> Groundbreaking know, series with the deference it deserves. I know it's a <laughs> listen. It's close to a lot of our hearts, and it's very important as a, as a, as a work of scholarship. I'd say it's very. It's you know the book series that launched a thousand podcasts. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, one of the first books on this that I really read seriously was actually Eric von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods. Yes, yeah. and I I love the idea. You know, because it is it's fascinating. It's so intriguing, and especially especially when you know like 20, 30 years ago when, um, when I was growing up reading those, you know, we, we didn't, we really didn't know a lot or or I should say this knowledge of the Mayan civilization and these other civilizations was pretty limited in terms of what I had access to, you know? So reading these things and reading about like the pyramids, um, you know, the pyramid, the angles and the pyramids, coming together in this function that made pi this special number i was like oh my god that had to be aliens and then you just find out that like pi is defined as the ratio of angles in a triangle and it isn't as interesting anymore that being said the problem with the idea is it becomes and this is the problem of a lot of paranormal ideas generally is it becomes it, it, it basically falls into a fallacy that's similar to the fallacy or similar to the argument style that um, Descartes used in his famous uh, meditations on first philosophy. And so the the argument essentially is, and, and I'm sure you all know this, uh, cogito ergo sum, right, is the famous phrase that Descartes said, which translates to, I think, therefore I am. So that specifically references, he he had this thought experiment and he was working at a time where he was trying to determine philosophers generally were trying to determine 
what could you know about the universe, about the world around you that came just from pure logic, just from rationalism, right? That didn't require experimental work or knowledge gained from outside of you. And so philosophers call this a priori knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to knowledge you gain from the world, which is called a posteriori knowledge. What Descartes determined was, so he goes through this, this, you know, it's a pretty short read and it's a really interesting work, I'd say. But so he goes through this kind of this lengthy discourse about, well, my eyes are wrong all the time about stuff, right? Like I get tricked. There's optical illusions. I don't see things all that well from far away, even though things are there. Um, I have dreams, right? I have all of these things. I misremember things all the time. I have there. There seems to be something about my my you know sensory apparatus, the sight and hearing and taste and feel and everything else that can be tricked. And so he posited this idea of what's called Descartes' demon, which is the idea that imagine that before all of the sensory input gets to you, right? So these you're seeing something from far away that information is traveling to you, but right before it gets to you, there is a demon who changes it in a way that makes it into what the demon wants you to see. Could you discern that that was happening? Right. The so answer is another no. way of right. The answer is no, and that's oh, why Descartes what color said, "Is the demon?" No. Okay, right. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, so and that's what and that's what Descartes said. Right was. The only thing, therefore, that I can know really in any way is that I must exist somewhere because I'm even thinking in the first place, right? So because I'm thinking, I must exist somewhere. That's the only thing that I can know. And then, you know, um, as you know, I assume Descartes packed up his books and was like, I'm done. I don't have to work ever again. (laughs) I, I did it. I figured it out. It's the only thing I can know. Um, that same argument style or that issue, I would say, applies to the ancient astronaut theory. You know, it, it becomes a point where it's like, OK, well, now we know that, for instance, the pyramids, the stones that built the pyramids, we know from basic physics that that a team of like 10 people could move one of those huge stones. You know, they would use tools, they would use rollers and things, but it's not impossible that they would move them. So then they say, OK, well, maybe then the aliens didn't build the pyramids. Maybe they just use them for something mysterious. And then we find out, well, the pyramids were used for X, Y, and Z, and they were constructed this way because of this. And every time we find more answers, they they kind of push the goalposts back. And they say, well, no, you know, it's getting to the point where, you know, next season on Ancient Aliens, they're going to be talking about how the aliens came down and helped us shimmy the stones over. You know, it, like the, the stuff that the aliens would have to do gets smaller and smaller every year as we learn more and more about the ancient world and about these sites. And eventually, though, at the at the root of that argument, you could always ask, well, who taught the aliens to do that stuff then? Yeah. Right? If, yeah. if the aliens came and taught us how to build the pyramids and Moai and everything else, who taught the aliens? Uh, other aliens, Chris. It's aliens right. all and, the way down. And, and so eventually, someone has to do the kind of basic science that we're saying humans did. So what's the point of the aliens in that in that argument then? Right? There is no point of them in that argument. They go away. And it's the same argument that comes up with things like, say, uh, what Jeb Card would call the grand unified uh, field theory of the paranormal, or the paranormal unified field theory. Um, this idea that, you know, well, in UFO cases, when you see a UFO, you're being abducted or something – the reason that all those cases are different is because the aliens are changing what you experience and see to be what they want you to remember. Well, D- Descartes' demon, right? We did right. that already. We did right. it like you know, we already had this argument, um, and it you know it worked out great for Descartes, but I don't think you could make the same point now, and it would work out as well for you. So it it just it becomes an argument that and that happens a lot of the times in these fields and it's because in my mind at least it's because these fields are not linked to a real academic history right right there are things that people have there are there are actual scientists that are working on the question of what a ufo abduction really is and what i mean by that is something like for instance you can ask If this is a hallucination of some sort, then it would appear that there are thousands of people in the United States and 
you know, even more across the world, having the same sort of hallucinatory experience. Well, what is the physical action that causes that experience? Right. right? What's the what's the mechanism in the brain, if nothing else? Exactly. Right. And 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 it turns out that just like with other types of uh, delusions or uh, thinking errors or whatever, people have similar people have similar uh, because we live in a in a world that's kind of shaped, you know, for humans. We have similar fears, right? Um, we have similar anxieties. We have similar things that we imagine. You know, we may not want to think that way necessarily, but there's a reason that there are certain phobias or certain types of dreams that are common. It turns out that maybe this the abduction experience is another one of those common things that is, for some reason, fearful to humans that happens due to a, you know, a chemical imbalance or something or whatever, right? Um, those kinds of questions are things that we can ask seriously. We can ask scientifically. and that one kind of presupposes the reality of the situation, right? The reality of the event itself in question. But there are questions that we can ask that don't presuppose that, right? Yeah. Um, there are thousands of people, again, and we've met, you know, I, I know, uh, I'm sure you guys have met them, right? I know, I know, Ben, you've met them when we went to the conference together. I've met many of them myself, too. There are people who legitimately believe that they've they've had a terrifying experience with something from the stars, you know, mm -hmm. um, that is not in dispute, right? What is in dispute is the reality of that underlying thing. But there is still a real, you know, a very real group of people who spend money on, on things that are harming them, you know, hypnosis sessions and herbal tea, you know, teas with crystals, you know, whatever in them and all kinds of junk, right? There are people take, being taken advantage of. There's a philosophical question, I think, there that is it ethical to let them be taken advantage of in that way? And a lot of those people, frankly, you know, they vote. A lot of those people make decisions for the rest of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, with their with their votes and with their political donations and with their activism and, and everything else. So getting a grasp on that, getting a getting an understanding of well, why do people believe these things? Uh, what effect does that have on their other beliefs about science or psychology or whatever? And and how does that affect the world that we all live in? You know, again, those are important questions that people are starting to grasp with, grapple with now. Um, that it's it's kind of starting to have an effect. You know, twenty years ago, not believing in climate change, it didn't really have an effect, right? When an entire country is aflame, um, it it seems to mean more. We're going to take a short break here. We'll be right back with Chris Cogswell right after this. And we're back with Chris Cogswell. Well, I would I I agree with that. I would also I would I would also advance that uh, just a bit to say that there are there are things that seemed uh, completely unreasonable to believe in or to give any serious credence to uh, 20 or 30 years ago that now are now are accepted as fact one of the one of the, and this is outside of the realm of the hard science but uh, one observation that we've always made about the term whoosh, whoosh, conspiracy theory is that it it is often used to uh, or the term fringe they're often used to uh, reduce the uh, the credibility of something such that it is put on the level of uh, like uh, on the level of the idea that the United Kingdom is run by these descendants of reptilian aliens and for some reason they're just real pills uh, because that's what they do. Uh, but but like for instance, 20, 30 years ago, a specific example, saying that uh, a large amount of the uh, so-called illegal drug trade was financed by state actors and uh, financially aided by international banking cartels, people, people did say, that's crazy, that's cockamamie. It turns out that that was very much the case, if not across the planet all the time. There are at least several examples where that provably was true. And, and one of the reasons I think that the realm of science uh, is, is unique and different in regard to this search for the truth is that we are able to 
regardless of our personal beliefs, we are able to reproduce experiments. We are able to make observations that are consistent once we understand all the variables involved. But I would also, I would also ask you this. This is the that sorry for that TED talk, guys. I just had to get that out there. But, no <laughs> but but I have to I have to ask you this. This is one of the questions that we always love to ask people who do have scientific acumen. Do you believe that it is possible uh, the U.S. or some other state actor has uh, created uh, technology that would be considered, you know, uh, more sophisticated than anything publicly available? Like, is the are all these uh, stories that we hear about suppressed technology true? And if so, to to what degree? You know, like we know. We know pr- that there are proving cases of, say, um, UFOs later turning out to be classified aircraft, right? Mm. But, or or but a, how, p- yeah. a, a particular alloy mm. or something that's only available at a particular place in a skunk work somewhere that you cannot find anywhere else. Yeah. So what – is there credence to that? And if so, how far does it go? What's the uh, – kind of asking you to be our, our canary in the critical thinking coal mine here. <laughs> Let us, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so has there ever been anything that you heard of where you said actually that uh, – uh, yeah, that, that is suppressed technology or is – or would you say most of it is more like, you know, campfire stories? No. Well, so – I mean, so well, first off – I just want to say, you're talking about the reptiles like that's not the truth, and I don't really appreciate it. <laughs> Man, he um, held on to that for so long. Good right. Good I'm, a little, yeah, I'm, a li- I'm a little myth, I got to say. Right? <laughs> they're, they're clearly reptiles. Look at the eyes. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, the – well, in reality, right, that science is always – like, so there's this idea in the sciences, and actually it's it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue – um, started really being an issue in psychology in um, like the early to late 2010s, right? Or not 2010s, the 2000s, right up to like 2010, let's say. And then it started to bleed over into other fields. Um, it turns out that science science has a crisis right now that's that's occurring um, with reproducibility. And the scope of the problem in some fields is really bad. Right. So in psychology, almost uh, a very small number of papers turn out to be reproducible. So in other words, that process that you're saying where if you do an experiment with scientific rigor in your lab and then you publish it, I should be able to replicate those experiments. It turns out there's not a lot of interest in publishing replication reports. Ah. That doesn't happen. So people haven't been replicating experiments, really. And so now it's starting to as that technology transitions from the lab into industry um companies are realizing oh my god we're wasting like i think the last figure i saw was it something like 50 percent of their research and development budget in some in some fields right biotechnology is one in one example in particular pharmaceuticals is one example um 50 percent of their research spend in a given year is wasted on reports that cannot be reproduced that are not wow. usable science right so that that is a very real problem affecting the sciences right now. So that's that's and that's why you see so many um, in the news and things. You know, oh, cancer has been solved, right? You know, cancer has been cured. We we figured out a way to cure cancer, and then it, you know, that never makes it to the marketplace, right? Mm-hmm. Because those papers that are so wonderful that seem to cure cancer. First off, it's like curing a single type of cancer in a specific mouse genetic line. You know, <laughs> right. you know, under very specific conditions and everything else and whatever. Um, but also a lot of those papers, like uh, uh, there's a reproducibility test done um, on cancer research in particular. And it was something like 90 percent of papers couldn't be reproduced. Now, this was back in like, again, the early 2000s. Right. And it's gotten it, it seems to have gotten more stringent and better. But that's it's still a problem. Right. So that's the first thing. And it's it's not something that science podcasts really talk about because it's kind of like the science's dirty secret right now. Um, but it's a huge issue. In terms of the the reason I bring that up though, not to just go on a wild tangent um for my own TED talk, is <laughs> um science is always 
and it depends on the field, but science is usually like the academic sciences are usually at minimum 10 to like 20 years advanced of what we have out there in the marketplace, you know? Um, and so the, the parts of science where we're really good, the public tends to get wrong. They, they tend not to know about. And the parts that we're actually pretty bad at, they also tend to be misinformed about. So I'll give you an example, right? Molecular modeling. So actually modeling a chemical um, reaction taking place. How many chemicals do you think we can react at once on a computer and have it work in like a sensible amount of time? Like let's say a day. Just modeling a reaction. Modeling a simple reaction. And one equals two chemicals interacting? Yeah, let's say like A plus B gives you C. Okay. Okay. Uh, I understand that. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy, right? Chemistry is easy. Um, um, so I'm, let's uh, – how about this? Give me – uh, I don't know. I was gonna. I was gonna shoot really low, just because it does seem like it is more complex than uh, I'm imagining. It's, I, it, okay. I'll. I'll. Because I'll, I'll, it's. It's a hard question to ask. It's a hard question to answer in the first place because it's like, how many apples do I have in my pocket? Like, yeah. you know, you don't know. <laughs> but, um, it's not many. It's not many molecules that we can model at once. Okay. Um, and when we do model them, we model them really simply, right? We do either something like, um, we know that A plus B goes to C. We also know C can go to five other things. We know that A plus C can go to a couple things. We know that B plus C can go to a couple things. So we kind of build it out that way where it's almost more like a, um, almost like the way Google searches work, right? It builds out almost like a neural net, not really a neural net, but you know, it builds out like a, almost like a tree branch graph. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, a and then based on tree. that, just based on pure probabilities of how many of these things result in product A, how many result in product B, how many result in product C. We do something like a Monte Carlo simulation and we just say, well, that's what we're going to get, right? We're, there's a chance that the highest percentage chance is we end up with chemical D at the end of this reaction. So that's what we predict will happen, right? But it turns out chemistry is really complicated, right? When something reacts, it doesn't just magically happen. It, it reacts because the molecules strike each other and there's enough force there. There's a force is kind of the wrong word, but there's enough energy in the collision that um, a reaction can occur. A bond can break and then another bond can form. Right. Yeah. That's super complicated. Um, and suddenly it's suddenly chemistry is a lot less like doing those kind of simple Monte Carlo simulations of, you know, we have this many possible reactants and these many possible reactions, et cetera it turns a lot more into something like modeling the crashing of cars, right? Um, of Monte you have to worry about, <laughs> as, right, of Monte Carlo cars, right? Yeah. Um, it suddenly becomes, you know, you have to take into account momentum and position and, you know, do you model one dimension or two or three or right? How do you do all of that? Um, it's really, it gets really complicated. We can't model past like a very simple reaction at this point. Our computers aren't fast enough. There's not enough processing power. And frankly, we don't know enough about how those reactions happen, really, right? Um, the one group that's really doing work like this, they're basically doing those kinds of Monte Carlo simulations um, out of MIT, you know? But actually modeling like a physical chemical reaction happening between two species that we don't study in the lab, just predicting based on their structure what reactions will happen, that's basically been the same. Like we've been doing that the same way since like the 18, 1890s, you know, when the periodic table of normal elements was essentially established, mm. right? Right. So that part we're really bad at. On the other hand, building alloys, building materials at the atomic scale, we're really good at that. That we've been able to do for decades, right? So making an atom, you know, a single layer thick of gold that sits in between, you know, sandwiched between two atomically thick layers of silver that attaches to a silicon wafer um, to test that surface conductivity or something. That stuff we've been able to do since essentially since we were young kids, you know, mm -hmm. um, nano engineering has been possible. It's, it's funny, actually, the material that I ended up working on in my PhD, um, the MCM 22 um, P chemical, which is mobile corporation matter number 22. And then P stands for precursor. That chemical was actually developed the year that I was born, like 30 miles from my house in New Jersey. Um, 
at, a, at an Exxon Mobil plant, a research and development plant. Yeah, um, I'm sure so we've nothing to... polluted the water anywhere at any time in Jersey. It's fine. Oh, no, I've got a couple of extra fingers, but it's fine. You know what I mean? It really helps in the lab, ultimately. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that that stuff we're really good at, like nanoengineering, material synthesis, material analysis, understanding of those sorts of things we're really strong at. So I would say in terms of, you know, the gut, you know, we don't have like an anti-gravity ray. We don't have a, a UFO someplace, right? That That's that's very, very unlikely. Have you However, worked at some, Groom Lake, Chris? No, I swear, I swear there is not a CIA agent here with a knife to my throat. <laughs> um, you know, that that level of technology, no, that there's no, I don't think there's really any evidence that we have that right now in the public space. However, the stuff that we can do in the lab scale is is so far out of the general realm of knowledge for most people that I would argue the the every man on the street, you know, has no sense really has no way of saying what is actually scientifically possible right now because we're it's so far outstretched what makes it into industry at this point. I see, and that problem is of course historically compounded by the. Uh by the errors of pop sci reporting at times, right? Uh, going yeah. back going back to your cancer in one line of uh, – a very specific cancer in a very specific line of uh, lab mice appears to have been mitigated to some degree in this specific application with all other things controlled. And then, of course, cut to Daily Mail 48 hours later, cure for cancer, uh, laboratory refuses to release de- further details, right? Probably right. Because exactly. they're waiting for their paper to publish. Um Okay, so that makes sense. It sounds like the argument then is is less one of nefarious activity and uh, – or it's also an argument, at least in part, that the average person is just not plugged into that world and there has to be a high level of attrition from successful laboratory work to widespread commercial and military application. Is that about yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean – you know, a good example that actually I actually use this example a lot. In, um, I just use this example a lot in my daily life, I guess I'd say, is uh, what what year do you think the first laser beam was was done in a laboratory? When do you think the first laser was developed? Uh, 1951. I'm going to go 1890. <laughs> All right. Split the difference. It was like 1920. Okay. Wow. Was we had a functioning laser beam in a laboratory, right? It was somewhere around there. The first, the the laser beam actually making it to the marketplace, though, the first time that technology made it to the marketplace of like everyday people was 1970. And um, what was its application? It was used, and it wasn't even really a public application. It was used for cutting. It was a CO2 laser for cutting of of metal. It was used in welding and metal cutting. Wow. Right. The first the first commercial use of a laser beam actually like in the public sphere was in barcode scanners in the 1980s. Wow. Yeah. Um, so this technology that Einstein worked on, you know what I mean? This is like this is a technology that changed the world as we knew it um, was was around for like 60 years earlier than most people realize, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's still stuff that, you know, that's that, that's the kind of argument that I'd say is really happening here is that first off, science is not science is not very good at uh, communicating with the public. Right. That's that's problem one. Like scientists aren't first off, scientists don't necessarily consider it to be part of their job. Right. To communicate with the public because the public's not really the people. I mean, in some ways, the public is funding the science. Right. Through your tax dollars. Sure. Um, but. Science as a whole, I would argue, doesn't really feel like it's their responsibility to communicate to the public generally. Mm. And that's a huge problem because it lets things like these pseudoscientific ideas and everything else affect the way that science gets done and the way that science is funded and, and just people's everyday lives. You know, um, the government shutdowns that happen in the United States, they're like they're very, very detrimental for science. You know, when those when that happens. People's cell lines are dying. People's um, people's experiments are not going finished, you know, um, because their funding comes from the government in many cases. So 
it is a serious thing. And, and again, I think we're just starting to realize the reverberations that uh, a general population distrustful of the sciences, distrustful of experts generally, but also just misinformed in many cases. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, science can't, scientists cannot sit in their ivory tower and just expect that it's not, you know, we're not going to feel the earthquake uh, affect us. Wow. So uh, I, I want to I want to now with that context with that lay of the land, uh, Matt and I would like to ask you for uh, a gut check on some specific things, right? Mysterious things, proven or disproven to some degree, are they real or not, or could they be in the future? Uh, first up, all right, man, don't hate us. Cold fusion. Yes, no, <laughs> in the future, what, what's going? on? Is it on? even possible? Where? What are your thoughts? So for listeners that don't, I guess for people that don't really know what cold fusion is, and I'm assuming you're, I mean, I know you guys, you know, it's general knowledge at this point, right? Right. Um, but the basic idea is currently what, what nuclear energy does is fission, which is two atoms, um, or rather an atom splitting right into two separate things. It's, it's, it's fizzle material. It will undergo fission and break up into two things. So uranium decays into two things. And then that decay releases energy that we then use to turn water into steam and then power a steam turbine, right? That That's how we get the energy out of a nuclear reactor. Yep. Fusion, on the other hand, would be two small molecules coming together and making a bigger one, or not molecules, but atoms interacting, coming together to make a bigger one, releasing far more energy. Um And the idea of it being cold fusion would be doing that in a way that it could happen at, uh, say, like a room temperature, right? Um, uh, Where it doesn't have to happen at the core of the sun. (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, Physics is in a weird spot right now, guys. Physics is in a really weird spot. Physics is kind of at a at a crossroads. So you're saying you're saying there's a chance. (laughs) I'm saying I'm saying that I'm saying that string theory didn't really pan out the way that a lot of people thought it would. Uh huh. And our understanding of kind of the atomic structure um, has sort of stalled. We, we've kind of known as much as we've known since. And I'm not. A, I'm not a physicist by training, right? I'm a, I'm a chemical engineer, uh, so more of like material science, I guess. Really, would be if you had to put a hat on me. Um, but physics has kind of sat in the same position. You know, since I don't know, the 1990s, maybe early 2000s, physics hasn't had any really big major breakthroughs. And that's because it's getting more and more energetically costly and just literally economically costly to do the experiments that are needed to do um, for people to, to come to some kind of understanding. So I would say that maybe cold fusion is a hard maybe, let's say. Right. Nice. Um, OK. But, wow, man. but. But here's the thing. If we could do it how would we even harness that energy right right right. um nuclear power plants today are huge right they're big facilities i mean they're not you know they're not like ginormous like a crazy you know amount of space needed or anything else but um they're quite large they have public sentiment against them generally i would say right and this is where that intersection between kind of politics and science and economics and sociology and all these other things, this is where this all comes into play. Maybe cold fusion could happen. If it does happen, would we even put it into development? If we did discover cold fusion, would we even use it? I think somebody would. Somebody would attempt to. And it would be outside of – it would probably either be a private institution or a country that developed it similar to the Manhattan Project where – it would be coveted and and the belief would be – this is just my opinion. But the belief would be that all countries or all powers are also you know, at this cutting edge of development and they are soon going to find out or you know, we cannot let anyone else find out. Like a first past the post kind of thing? That's what it feels like to me. I but mean, maybe I'm wrong. It definitely – It could happen, right? But this yeah. is actually part of that argument. This is part of the argument that happens a lot in these kind of far out there fields with these kinds of crazy technologies, right? One – really famous example of a pseudoscience that has kind of stuck around for a long time because the military keeps funding it for God knows what reason 
is zero point energy research, right? right? Similar kind of idea in that the promise of it is that we would end up with basically a limitless source of energy, right? We'd end up with, with a, a perfectly, you know, almost more than perfectly efficient system that's pulling energy essentially out of the void. The vacuum space uh, breaks, you know, every law of thermodynamics. It's completely wacky, but um, it's such a big promise. And, you know, it's not very costly to investigate because you just need a pen and paper and some knowledge of calculus um, that, you know, it's it's all theoretical at this point, so it's not really a hard spend, right? But mm-hmm. um, that idea even, right, again, if we did have – just think about the, the societal impact that would have, right? If we, def- if we developed cold fusion, immediately all of the geopolitics around the Middle East goes away. Do we think that we would stick around in the Middle East if we didn't need oil anymore? That seems unlikely, right? Would we worry about North Korea anymore? If if we had if we had or or would we think about them the same way? If we suddenly had the ability to produce a near infinite source of energy, what would our responsibility then be to poor countries where they don't have the resources to produce infinite energy? Right. right. It's not going to cost us anything to transmit it to them because it's infinite. Right. There's an infinite source, so it it doesn't really matter anymore how much efficiency it takes to transport energy. Um, Because we don't care, right? We can just dial up the other side. Um, All of those things are like huge, huge questions and huge issues. And I think that there are a lot of the reason why these energy technologies are stopgap a lot of the time. I mean, actually, one of the first one of the first papers I wrote about this stuff. um, And, you know, since when I when I chose grad school in chemical engineering, I kind of, you know, you have to at a certain point, you got to pick. You're sitting there in the philosophy classroom. You're like, am I going to go for a philosophy PhD or chemical engineering PhD. I went with chemical engineering, but I'm hoping one day to go back to get the philosophy one. Nice. But uh, anyways, the uh, one of the papers I wrote about this sort of subject in the kind of philosophical realm was looking at the United States. We've always lagged behind Europe in adopting energy technologies because we have a lot more resources, like a lot more natural resources. So the United States, Europe was almost done with coal by the time we started using it <laughs> because right. we had so many trees that we could just burn them. We just, we didn't matter to us. The same thing is true about why we haven't adopted really nuclear energy the same way that some other countries have renewable energy, right? We have so much space and so much water um, that it, you know, having a dirty coal plant in your town or, in, you know, in some part of the middle of nowhere in, you know, um, wherever right sure uh, doesn't have the same effect it does if it's in the middle of dresden or the middle of berlin or or paris right this is so weird my uh, road close to my house is called dresden and i totally had that and sorry that has nothing to do with this conversation. <laughs> but it's <laughs> <just thought>. uh, <laughs> anyways so yeah so so there's a lot of stuff to think about there but so cold cold fusion i think is a, i think it's a maybe that we would develop the i think we're going to learn more about the underlying science that would make something like that possible i just don't I personally actually don't think that there would be enough economic driving force to make it become something that industry picks up. At present. We, yes. I've got one more for you yes. that we're getting yeah, out of here. I promise one this more, is the last one, one we got to go. Uh, silicon-based life. Go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, an easy one. Such an easy one. <laughs> yeah, we thought it'd be um, a, a nice softball. No, but wait, honestly, do you th- uh, it's theoretically possible. It, it's I'm I wondered from just with your chemical background if you imagine I mean obviously you can't prove it or not but perhaps the likelihood that somewhere on some distant uh, plane silicon was the the chemical that brought forth life. So um, it's yeah I think that it's definitely a possibility right for listeners or for people that don't necessarily kind of get why silicon would be a good option. Um, I suggest you, if you're not driving or like doing something important right now, um, pull up a periodic table on, on, uh, the internet and look at where carbon sits on the periodic table, right? So carbon sits in, um, carbon is element number six. And so it sits in, uh, it sits essentially in column, uh, 14, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right underneath carbon is silica, right? Silicon, um, The reason that we think silicon could be another source of kind of the chemistry of life like carbon is, is because they're in the same, uh, that same column of the periodic table, 
right? Elements that are in that same elements in the same um, column have the same electronic configuration. They have the same valence shell or outermost shell of electrons. And that's the shell that actually inter- undergoes chemistry. So that's why we think silicon might have similar properties to carbon in that it can bond in kind of a tetrahedral shape. Um, it might be very amenable to things like polymerization. And we actually know that silicon does essentially undergo polymerization. That's how I made most of my materials in school. Um, anyways, I think that it's it's a it's a possibility, right? But we also have a very we have a very stringent view again of what life constitutes, you know. So um, we tend to think that an alien species is going to need to digest food in a similar way that we do. We assume that they'll talk, that they'll they'll use sound waves to communicate to one another. We assume that they'll have you know, legs and arms, right? And usually they'll have two of them that are just a little bit smaller and a little bit grayer. Right. right? They right. just got big, bulbous, weird heads. Mm-hmm. Um, we assume that they, that we assume that they see, we assume that they don't, they only have five senses. They don't have more senses than we do, or they don't have less, right? All of that are huge assumptions. And so we make the same kind of assumptions with our chemistry too, in some way, the idea of it being like a silicon based life form, um, we assume that that would mean something like the the kind of amino acids and the DNA structure and everything else would form um, where just silicon replaces carbon. And that's certainly one possibility, but we have no concept of what causes really consciousness, right? It's one of the biggest, it, it is the biggest unanswered question for and kind of the last hill on which metaphysics will die is this idea of consciousness. If you take the, and I've said this word before, materialist, right? The materialist view in the sciences is this idea that uh, everything reduces down to the interactions of, of atoms. So your emotions, if we had a powerful enough computer, your thought, you know, you think of a red ball bouncing. If we had a powerful enough computer, the materialist, the pure materialist would argue that we could just by modeling the interactions of all of the atoms and all of the molecules inside of your brain, we could replicate that thought in an artificial being. And we could therefore cause you to have thoughts too by affecting your neural networks in different ways and whatever. A non-materialist or someone who's not so inclined to believe the materialist point of view would say that you, your consciousness does not seem to reduce fully down to those interactions of atoms. Right. There are there are properties of the mind and of the world that don't reduce down to their individual parts. So um, how would your neural network or how would the interaction of the atoms inside of your brain explain the pain you feel when remembering a painful moment? It's easy. Mirror neurons. I get it. Well, but, you know, it's, <laughs> no, I totally understand what you're saying. It's so abstracted. It's so abstracted from you know atom a interacting with atom b and causing molecule c to be produced that's a chemical that causes it you know it's so abstracted at that point that it's really hard to conceptualize that that might be the link so we don't we don't even know that they need you know what if we find out in 50 years in in 10 years in two years whatever what if we find out that consciousness is just caused by i don't know you know uh, anything you know we can pick anything that we want to be the cause of consciousness yeah i believe um, it was originally a mushroom cult uh mm-hmm. they were they got into some psilocybin uh, i think that's uh, where it came from pretty sure pretty sure <laughs> but you know what i'm saying though right like it, it could be we might not recognize life um because we don't have the way to communicate with it right wittgenstein ah, yeah. said famously right um, if a lion could speak we wouldn't understand him and that's a lion you know what I mean? Like they yeah. think they have our chemistry. Um, forget a, an alien that you know might be silicon based or whatever. So I don't know. I mean, it's definitely possible, and I think it'll be really interesting as we get better at chemistry to kind of try to build some of those building blocks and see if they do interact in the same way. And you know, um, we're kind of it's kind of a weird situation right now where the public generally believes in all this stuff as being possible. 
Um, and, and that's kind of bore out by the statistics that you quoted at the beginning and everything else. Um, and science is is taking some of it more seriously than it would have before, but not in the way that kind of the UFO community would want them to. You right. know, yeah. So they're you know, it's not there's not scientists coming out onto the lawn of the White House and being like, you know, aliens are real. You know, your uncle was right the whole time. Um, <laughs> At least they're coming yeah. out. They're coming out and saying like, you know, the chances of there being life developing on another planet is so you know it, the, the chance of it not happening is so small that we have to take into consideration that it could be the case absolutely and this this at, at this point christopher I'm, unfortunately we are uh we are getting the signal from mission control my friend we've said too much for today uh so before the the uh to say hello to the cia guy who's got the he still has that knife at your throat uh, <laughs> uh and hello to our intern at the nsa steve uh this has been this has been fantastic this has been a very broad look at a number of different things and i like that we're ending on a more uh inspirational note you know we truly are at a crossroads uh so i i have a motion for the table which today is me matt and everybody listening hi okay uh i propose that we uh we promote uh christopher cogswell from uh, from guests on stuff they don't want you to know to our uh, to our, our our team of scientific consultants, right? Science Ooh. consultants. Are you okay with that? You comfortable with that? Oh man, do I get a pen? Uh, <laughs> we're working on the pen, and uh, to be honest, mm, uh, a lot no, of I'm the, in. I'm in. Fine. Uh, I'm uh, in. Great. I'm in. Okay. Uh, soft note: a lot <laughs> of the stipend is in Ben Bucks, and it, it is, and it's based. <laughs> it's a germanium based uh, metal, but don't worry, it's gonna be fine. Yeah. So there you uh, go. Seriously, uh, we would love to we we would love to dive in more uh, to these to these topics in future episodes. Matt and I have a list of stuff we didn't quite get to today, but hopefully there's always another podcast in the future. So thank you very much, Christopher Cogswell. The podcast is the Mad Scientist Podcast. Uh, Chris, where can people learn more about you, your co-host, and uh, the show on the on the social meds? So you can go to the mad scientist podcast.com. You can also find us on Twitter at mad scientist podcast. Um, I'll be the one arguing with UFO guys. Uh, <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, super fun. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Um, you can always, you know, uh, find us the mad scientist podcast. Our logo is pretty, pretty easy to recognize. Um, it's like an explosion of science stuff with me and Marie looking, or it's a jack-o'-lantern face. So go check it out. Um, yeah. Find us anywhere, man. Uh, we're always happy to have people come on and talk. And guys, I'd love to come back on anytime you want me. Hey, we're we're certainly interested. We didn't talk about the Black Knight satellite. We didn't talk about <laughs> cases that you couldn't explain. Uh, yeah, we like your the closest thing you've come to experiencing that line between magic and technology. No, Arthur it's all C. good. Clark. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll oh, get guys, there. we got yeah, we got we got so much stuff for another. <laughs> we have so much ammo for another episode. You let me know when I'm coming back on. It's gonna I be mean, great. You were talking about abduction theories, and I was like kind of crouched on my seat here, waiting to bring up sleep paralysis and some right. of the, the topics we brought yes. up. We didn't we didn't hit any of that. It's all good. Well, we'll just have everybody go through hypnotic regression and convince them that they did, in fact, hear that other episode. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> Plant some memories. That's a little unethical, even for me. Uh, yes, this ends our episode, but not our show. Please do check out the Mad Scientist podcast. We believe you will enjoy it. Uh, you can also continue the conversation with our favorite part of the show, your fellow listeners. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We particularly like to recommend our favorite Facebook page. Here's where it gets crazy. If you don't want to do any of that stuff, you can give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. Leave us a message. You might get on the air, or you might just entertain us, or you might make our day. Uh, any, or you might terrify us. Oh, yeah. Hey, I'm down with that. That's fun. That's still entertaining in yeah, my book. A little umami in life, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, and if you don't want to do that either, uh, please send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com.
Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.